We can see the whiteboard. Okay. Let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for the opportunity that we have um, at the latter part of Sabbath to go back and revisit some of the things we started discussing in the morning. Thank you that you give us the platform to share ideas, to learn more about the kingdom that you're wanting to set up. I pray that you may continue teaching us. I pray that we may continue teaching each other. And I ask for the Holy Spirit's presence um, at this time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay. By means of a recap, just um, to briefly go over what we discussed this morning, um, so we can continue on from where we left off. Um, not sure who's admin, but could you please pin the screen? Okay, so to recap where we were, we started off by trying to set the stage of understanding what it exactly a movement is. So we shared the thought, the idea that a movement consists of in a broad at a broad level has three aspects it has its origins and causes um it has its goals and objectives that it's seeking to to fulfill and then you have its methods and tactics and so whichever movement you look at there will be those three key aspects um an example of that is a political party that's seeking election will hand out a manifesto and contained within that manifesto are all the things that that political party sees as their goals and their objectives. And in addition to that, how they'll go about achieving those goals and objectives. We understood a movement as consisting of individuals who come together, who have a shared ideology about how they think about the world or the problem that they're seeking to address, or more specifically, the problems that they're coming out of. So a movement arises due to the current long-standing issues that have existed and these individuals would say are fed up with these long-standing issues, whatever they may be in whatever context it is. And so they have a shared ideology about how to resist whatever is taking place or initiate different changes within their society, within their church, if we're speaking about religious context, um, or if we're speaking more generally about the culture of society with regards to its norms, its practices, its policies, the institutions and structures that it makes up. And so you have this coming together um, to build a movement. Um, we described a movement as being an umbrella term. Uh, and this morning I was drawing my nice little picture of my umbrella thinking you could all see it. But alas, that was not the case. But now you can see my umbrella of a movement encompassing either religious movements or political movements. It can be whatever shade um, you want to put it in, but it's it's within a specific context. The reason why we explored that avenue was a question came up of what are we? Are we a church or are we a movement? And if we take this umbrella notion, we would see that um, a church is a movement because a church recognizes a problem in society and wants to make changes to that society through, we'll say, the gospel. Um, if you want to put it in an evangelical framework, through the spreading of the gospel. And then you get political movements that are solely um, touch on political aspects and the two can overlap but to answer that question I said we'd leave that to the end if we can just understand 
that dynamic of what a movement is. So then I started going through examples just to get us used to the notion of seeing a movement, its causes and origins, its goals and objectives, and its method and tactics. So the first one we went through was the Millerite movement. And we saw how the Millerites are coming out of the Dark Ages, this 1260 years of papal oppression. And its origins we would place in 1798, and Charity and Blessing offered um, explanations of what caused this, this revival or this new birth of this religious experience. Um, in brief, if you can, Charity, in, in two sentences, if you remember, remind us why the Millerite movement arose in the first place. What are they? What do they see as the long-standing issues coming out of the Dark Ages? Well, if I can remember, <laughs> uh, but I think I I touched on the the issue of uh, interpretation, how mm -hmm. they interpreted the Bible, which was quite different from the Protestant churches and. Basically, their conclusions were you're talking about objectives. Sorry, you said no like, origins sorry. and causes. Oh, so, okay, okay. Yep, you're on the <laughs> you're on the right track. Okay, yes, interpretation of the the Bible. Yeah, basically. yeah. So it was different from how the Protestant churches had been interpreting the Bible. So it led them into having a movement that was basically resisting the way in which they understood mm -hmm. the the text scripture i mean blessing in addition to that added thoughts um regarding an individual's experience which in a very brief summarized form blessing could you share i thought i'd escape that one <laughs> The reason I'm asking is because I can't remember. <laughs> uh, I, remember. Um, I think the, the idea that I was trying to bring out is, um, what is it? Uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> individual, <laughs> yeah, individual. Basically, that um, individual members. Uh, or individual Christians are active participants in the plan and work of salvation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So they could shape their destiny and they could actually study the Bible for themselves. And, sure. Um, so, yeah. can the papal rule or how the papal church had operated, it was coming through God through a human agent. And so it was the the door in which you could access God was through the papal church. And the implications of that are, are far reaching. It's, it's not just within that religious context. You see that within the political atmosphere, if you look at kings and queens um, and look at how societies were formed, it was all part of that same mindset. It was the divine right of kings to rule, which was ordained by said Pope. And so you have the great enlightenment um, during this period, and you have societies changing from being ruled by kings to wanting to form democracies. And so in that context, in that climate, you see the religious experience also wanting these same things um, or striving for these same things. And so this is this is the context, this is the origin, the causes, but you have goals attached to that. And the goals that we discussed um, of the Millerite movement was wanting to educate society to prepare them for the second advent, because it was a long-standing idea that before Jesus could come, you, there was this millennium, this thousand years of peace that the kingdoms of this earth would usher in. But instead, 
God raises up a people to educate society that that can't be the case, that instead the kingdoms of this earth can't achieve that goal. So I, being God, am going to prepare you to live in a kingdom that would offer peace, that won't be on this earth, or should I say before that thousand years um, or that millennium that the Bible speaks of, if you want to put it in that context. So that's the goal. That's the objective to prepare. And then the methods would be, if we could say simplistically for the Millerite experience is just evangelism by spreading the gospel through teaching, through um, preaching. It's doing outreach from a sole individual's thought and idea of how to interpret the Bible, being William Miller, to sharing that with other people and getting people on board with the message that he had. If we were to take another example outside of religious context and apply it to feminist movements, broadly speaking, we recognize that their goal is to address gender inequality in society. And so we went and we looked at first wave feminism. What were its origins? What were its goals? And what were its methods of how to address the problem? So if we say that its origins is happening in the context of different revolutions that are happening around the world, the French Revolution, where women are fighting for their rights, the temperance movement, where women have an active participation in, in wanting to, in, in the temperance movement, and within the abolitionist movement as well, in wanting to abolish slavery. Women had been excluded from public life up until that point. So society had been structured a certain way and you have women standing up and saying, hold on, we don't exist. We aren't seen, we are seen as second class citizens. We don't have any of the rights that this new democracy is, is championing. You've created a liberal democracy to run away from kings, but you've left us behind. And so you have the suffragettes stand up and say, our goal is to have those same rights that your liberal democracy that you've created promises humanity. We don't have them. You've said all men are created equal. But clearly, that equality is dependent on who you are. And so you have the fight for the right to vote. And that's the suffragette movement, the 19th Amendment being the hallmark of first wave feminism. So the focus was on equality from a mainly legal perspective. What legal rights could women achieve in that era of feminism? And you have the right to vote. And subsequently, you we see that reproductive rights are won through lobbying governments, through fighting for that right. We recognize that that's been curtailed, but just tracing that history, uh, marital rights were won. And in all these rights that we see that are being won by feminist movements along the way, they're done through a legal lens. It's going to the government, fighting the government, sharing your cause with the government and saying, the laws that are on paper don't include us. They exclude us. So we want to be included in this legal system. So it's strictly from a legal perspective. Often when we've described liberal feminism and radical feminism, we've looked at radical feminism as being political and liberal feminism as not being political, when in fact they both are. And that's what I wanted to point out, that in, in wanting to achieve the right to vote, in gaining reproductive rights, in, in ensuring marital rights, these are all done through a legal framework. It's wanting to get laws passed. And the way you do that is by looking at the politics of the hour and seeing how you can use said politics to your advantage to get what you need for said politics. So both are political movements. They're both approaching the problem politically, but then 
how we go about addressing the overarching problem is where we see that differentiation. Um, so we discussed mainstream feminism because by understanding this, I th is the word pseudonym, pseudonym, um, this alternative way of phrasing it being mainstream feminism, we got the definition of what mainstream was. It's something that's popular. It exists throughout society in a generic sense. And so if that's what mainstream is, then we recognize that feminism that is mainstream is not necessarily going with the status quo, but it's looking at what's pop, what exists. So that structure, those systems, those processes already exist. So how can we integrate women into those existing structures? Looking at that word liberal and its root liba, um, meaning to be free, we can see why women wanted to be free. Because going from a place of restriction, from restrictive choices, restrictive lives, restrictive careers, in all things restrictive that pre-1798 offered society in general that didn't offer women, that desire for liberty is a natural outcoming of being in oppression. So the goal is for equality and the, the key um, underpinnings of what liberal feminism through the banner of first wave fem or through the era of first wave feminism is fighting for said equality, individuals' rights, personal autonomy, but that liberation is achieved through integrating women into this system that they've been excluded from. So let's compare and contrast that to how we understand radical feminism. And so we didn't do it um we didn't do it in the study this morning specifically but let's let's define radical feminism word by word so we know feminism being the fight for equal rights how do we and you could give me a google in fact i i like the definition that google gives but so if someone could share what does radical mean just the definition of the word radical. Right. So root it's cause. it's root what what about the root cause? I guess to the root of the issue. Sorry, I can't hear you too well. I guess to the root of the issue. Mm -hmm. Root of um the patriarchy, sexism, it's the... Okay. Without bringing in sexism, patriarchy, just, I, you could just get up to that point of defining radical. Like a dictionary wouldn't focus only on on sexism and we would just get a generic definition. And I think, I think you gave it. It's that it's relating, how it says um, in a dictionary is relating to or affecting the fundamental nature of something. So being far reaching or thorough. So that's where you get this concept of root. It's because it's relating to the fundamental nature of that thing. So we gave the example of weeds in a garden. To deal with weeds in a garden, you address the fundamental nature of that weed. Where does that weed come from? Where is it birthed? and it's birthed in its roots. We would say in its seeds that grows its roots, but it's held into the soil by its roots. So if you're going to address the weed, you pull out the root, its fundamental property. So that's what radical means. So addressing the fundamental nature and as Richard said you get this idea of getting to the root of the problem so now yep 
Who was that? Sorry. Simba. Yep. What about if we say extreme? Yeah. So if we, the the reason why I I'm trying to not use the word extreme. It's correct, and I think when you truly uh put the word extreme in the right context, you get what I'm trying to achieve. But the reason why I'm I'm, I'm avoiding it is because when we think extreme, we think different. We think far reaching, like it's it's never been done before. And so, which I don't necessarily think on its own is is a true definition of what I'm trying to bring out at least. So the examples that get given when we talk about the different eras and what they achieve, we often um, we often associate how God has done something very different to how it was done before. And we associate that with being extreme and radical. When in the point that I'm trying to make is that radical is specifically related to the framework in which something is built. So it is extreme when you look at extreme as being uphauling a system or overhauling a system, but not in the way we generally think about extreme as far reaching um, or completely different to what the status quo is. Thank you, I got it. Okay. Uh, charity, blessing. I just wanted to say another definition uh, says also it's uh, advocating or based on thorough or complete political or social change. It has this idea of um, uh, basically advocating for for something that's a complete change, basically, mm -hmm. whether it's socially or politically. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that also, uh, like, speaks to religious as well, but I guess it could as well. Yeah, it could definitely. And so when you think of this idea of complete and thorough, it means the entirety of the problem is being addressed. When you address something radically, it means the entirety of it. It's what gives birth to the problem, what upholds the problem and keeps it existing and what causes future problems like it to exist. You're getting rid of that foundation that upholds all of that when you address something radically. So we have these two schools of thought, liberal and radical, that look at an institution or a system that exists so if we say a system and give an example of slavery or actually let me put government let me give an example of government so how we're going to govern society america is this up and coming democracy in the world it's different from what's existed before. It's, I'm going to use the word, it's radically different from what's existed before because it's a new system. What they had was kings that ruled. And now instead of having kings that ruled, the system of governing people, instead of using kings, we're going to have democracy. We're going to have elected officials to govern. So it's radically different because at its root, it's a complete thorough overhaul of the system that existed before. So we're left with democracy now, right? We get to the 1850s and feminists look at that system, democracy, liberal democracy, and they say women are excluded from this system. So how are feminists going to approach that problem? Are they going to approach it radically or are they going to approach it liberally? Remember how we defined the two. Liberal integration, liberation through integration 
and radical being addressing the root core of the problem, of the issue. So America set up the system of government that excludes women from it. It's excluded people of color from it as well, but we'll stick to the story of feminism. So how are the suffragettes going to approach that problem when they fight for the right to vote? In the system. Why is so, it in the system? Yeah, go on. So in the system, so um, they're trying to bring different laws, mm -hmm. um, get some more rights, but it's not changing the whole system. That's how I see it too, is that they see, okay, in the system, men get to vote. We don't get to vote. We would like to get to vote as well. So let's go to the system. Let's speak to the lawmakers. Let's protest. But the way in which we're going to make changes is by negotiating with that existing system. And so that negotiation with that existing system leads to that system then giving women that right to vote that they didn't have before. So if we look at it in that context, we can see suffragettes as being the um, achieved or the right to vote as being achieved through the framework of liberal feminism. In the system, radical feminism will say, we need a new system entirely that doesn't even give rise to problems like this in the first place. And so there's three different ones, which we'll get to, um, three different examples, and we'll go through them and see, okay, is it approaching it from a liberal perspective or from a radical perspective, being the right to vote, reproductive rights, marital rights, whichever rights that you can think of that have been won by different feminist movements up until today. Uh, but Curtis... Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't they work within the system because anything too radical from that would um, would not be accepted? So wouldn't they work within the system at that time um, if they had to come in a really kind of, maybe, well, I, I don't know, I'm just saying maybe a for, forceful way, maybe they wouldn't be take... Um, regarded as um, they wouldn't think... be sorry? No, Karen, sorry. They wouldn't be uh, <clears throat> they would be regarded as, I don't want to use the word extreme but I can't think of anything else here. So sure. they had to work within that system at that time because it was a new thing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that in in connection with that thought is again why I'm hesitant to to think of radical in that way as being something that society wouldn't accept is because there's instances where God works radically as being completely different. It sets up something completely different to what the norm was. And that doesn't necessarily mean that um it was a struggle or it was difficult to do. Um, the example I gave was this democracy. That was radically different because it was a completely different system. But yet society slash God does it anyway. So in asking the question of why are some things done through a liberal lens and why are some things done through a radical lens or method, um, yes, there is the aspect of society is not ready for some changes, but I think there's something more to that as well. I don't know if that makes sense. Absolutely. Thank you. So, did someone want to say something before we move on? I was going to say, actually, because it's on that point that 
that when you look up radical feminism, say on Google, it does say that a lot of these things were won by radical feminists, not liberal. So whether that's just because of our this thing about because it was pretty radical what the suffragettes did in you know the turn of the century, their behaviour, the way they were treated, lots of stuff about that was very, um, different. I guess, radical in terms of what we're trying to stay away. Different, massive change. They wanted massive change. It was a huge hit in the face to the the men. I don't know. It's, it seems like I'm still wrestling with that concept. I guess it's linked to Cedric's question. Yeah. That what what would it have looked like for a radical feminist to now tackle that situation? How would it have looked different? I think that's what the struggle mm -hmm. is. I don't know if you're going to, so I don't want to preempt anything, but it sure. is that how to tackle the root of that problem. Because because even though, because we're, we're saying obviously on one hand that they both agree with equality. They both want equality for women. They both want women to be treated better, have rights, whatever, have a voice. And how they're going about it is different. So we keep looking at how the liberals or what, we, what we're terming as liberal go about it because they're working within the system. But I think for me that the struggle is how would they have done it otherwise? What would they have done? And actually, we gave the example of the government with America. Um, I, I still don't know in my own head how they would have done that, how a radical feminist back then would have said, well, would they have joined with the liberals if we're saying the liberals did that and said, yes, we need to, first of all, we need to get some kind of voice or vote here because we can't change the whole system overnight, which is kind of where Siri's coming from, I guess. Yeah, sorry, maybe it's the same mm. question. Um, but I struggled with the definition when I looked at radical and saw that radicals were actually given the, mm -hmm. I guess, the accolade for achieving those things. So there's two, there's two parts to that is I've avoided reading definitions of radical feminism from the internet for that very reason because right. if you go to a source that says these people were radical feminists i can bring you a counter source that says these people were not radical feminists so instead of approaching like here's your evidence and here's my evidence let's try and dig out you know what we understand by approaching the pro by what we're doing let's try and come to the conclusion on our own going through it step by step. That's why we started off by understanding where the context of liberty comes from and this context of radical addressing the fundamental nature of something. And if we can set the stage of these two things, what the definition is and compare and contrast them, then we can look at these issues and say, okay, was this achieved through liberal feminist means or was it achieved through radical feminist means? not necessarily letting, I don't know, other people's interpretations of it shape our path, but let's let's work through it for ourselves. That's what I've tried to do, at least. Um, I think it's, I agree, yeah, I think that's why we're doing this. And it's, and it's getting away from that idea of what radical looks like and mm -hmm. going by these terms and by that your definition of them. It was this a liberal way of doing it or a radical way of doing it, which is, overthrow the system or work within the system if you stick good sorry you cut radical. out for a bit there emma oh and i'm just agreeing with you basically yeah and saying that we need to go with your can you hear me yeah i can now can you hear me? yeah sorry we need to go with your definitions yeah the, or the definitions we've got here about it being the root and are they working in the system or are they working to overthrow the system and just stick with that and not go with as you say, what other people say radical is or extreme or massively different from what had gone before, those kind of things steer away from that. Yeah. Okay. Got you. Good. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, okay. I'll go blessing okay. and then Magda. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know, um, I mean, this is a, a concept I'm wrestling with as well, mm -hmm. um, more and more. And I think one of the challenges that comes with it is, uh, I mean, our thought leader <laughs> taught us something. Yeah, you know, yeah, elder test or something. I'm not saying what elder test taught us. A blessing. Can you speak up, please? Oh, you can't hear me. Can you hear me now? You, you're sounding distant. I don't know. Can Curtis, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I don't know. Can you hear you, you, you well? put, put your volume up, maybe. Yeah. All right. So I was saying um, that. Um, no, I forgot what I was saying. <laughs> Our thought leader led us in a certain direction. Yes, yes. And I was saying what Elder Tess did was not bad. I'm not saying it was bad. I think I think it was necessary. Mm -hmm. But I, I also feel like we we have to constantly deal with the issue of sort of like staying in one place. 
when a certain statement is said within a particular context mm -hmm. that we don't stay there and don't like continue to progress and understand better what has been presented. So I'll give a simple example that Elder Pamina gave as well. That Elder Test recommended a tool for fact-checking information. And that was the media bias fact check, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And Elder Pamina challenged that notion. He was saying, I'm not saying people shouldn't use the media bias fact check. But the thing is, even if Elder Test were to recommend that source, it doesn't then mean you like implicitly trust that source as the final authority for uh, a reliable source of information. There is much more that you as an individual have to do, us as a movement have to do, to actually understand what makes up a good source of information and what makes up a bad source of information. And I think Elder Tess would agree with that, that, you know, you can't take something that was meant to be one tool to help you in a certain context and make it the only tool that helps you. So I'm, I'm trying to bring it also to this discussion we're having about liberal and radical. And definitely a lot of, most of what we know about liberal and radical and how we are to approach the two, we receive from Elder Ted. And I'm saying, I'm not saying what she said was wrong. What I'm saying is how we understand it should grow, should basically improve. That okay, when we say we're a radical feminist movement, what does that mean? Where does it apply? What are the limitations of it? Uh, when we look at the work of feminism in the past, you know, uh, how has it actually worked, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and where has it failed? Because, I mean, one thing I've been struggling with is this. If the rights that we have today, and I'm saying we, the women, but we, the feminists, if the rights that we, the feminists, have today were one through radical means, then we wouldn't have Dobbs v. Jackson, well, um, Women's Health Organization. You know what I'm saying? We're actually talking today and say the, the, the Sunday law is coming and it's a Sunday law to do with gender because the rights that we won were won in a fragile manner. They are not enduring. They are not persistent. Because if the underlying root had been dealt with, then definitely... Today, we wouldn't be crying about abortion rights being abolished. We wouldn't be, you know, talking about the other, the LGBTQ rights that are constantly being attacked within the United States, because I know we use the United States as our point of reference normally. So definitely when we look at these things, it challenges us, you know, and it challenges our notion of how we view the history of feminism, how we understand liberal and radical and how we're also going to understand the message that has been given to us by the messenger of God's choosing, in this case, Elder Test. So yeah, I just wanted to share that as well, you know, just what has been my struggle in this journey, because mm -hmm. it might help someone else that, you know, I think I agree with the approach that you are taking that, look, we have to, we have to keep looking at these things. We have to challenge ourselves. We have to grow. We have to be honest as well, intellectually honest about how things have happened and are happening. And also the fact that, like you said, a source might term things radical because in the world, there's already a view of what radical means you know, and how radical it should be. But that source might not necessarily be a defining source. You know, It doesn't then become authority. That I read four articles that say um, Roe v. Wade was won by radical feminists. But, you know, should we... Should we then settle and think, you know, we've got all it down, uh, like we've get, we have everything down pat, we've mm -hmm. figured everything out, and this is how things go, or we should actually continue to look at these things and say, okay, so we might have thought we understood, probably we understood to a certain degree, which was okay for 2021 or 2022, but now we're in 2024, and it seems like we're being challenged to understand this further and go deeper into the subject. Yeah, that's what I just wanted to say. I did have my hand up. Can I speak? Um, I'll let Magda and then you can speak because Magda had wanted to say something. Up for the hands then. Okay, so my thought was, um, so by giving out laws, um, it is still within the system. So that's still liberal approach. How to bring the radical, the new system? Because I kind of like, 
see it impossible to do it in this world. I can see it that we, uh, as a movement, um, doing that, um, and it will carry on in heaven, but many people will be lost because they wouldn't accept this type of system. Um, so I can see that maybe a little institution could completely change approach, like in some little institution where many people wouldn't want to work there because they wouldn't agree with it. And that's something what we see and will see in our movement. Um, even like when today I shared about this uh, man who I was speaking with and his company and the approach with the company. So they do look into the roots of things before they investing somewhere or something. So they turn out like, for example, business where it was something with trafficking. But he told me, but they still do have a traces of where they working still with oils and that stuff. They trying to minimize it. So you see there's still compromise. Um, but I believe you could have a maybe little institutions where they could change, but not the whole world. So I don't see how it would be really possible to change it in this world when you look at, um, yeah, like even like the loss taking time to do it, but it's still within the system, but to change complete the system, only way I see to do it is really through this movement. Um, and then carry on in heaven with people who agrees and wants to be in the system. I I was thinking about it a lot since the presentation and I just don't see any way how it would be possible here. Yeah, that's my thoughts. Um, Natalie? Yeah, I just thought that we've always had a wrong concept and the world has as well of what a radical feminist is feminism means equality for all not just women so for me radical feminism means equality for all not just women mm -hmm. um well, emma the I had to make a point obviously go through the three feminisms I, th I think going back off what magda was just saying i think that's what i didn't word it very well when i said it before and i think i I wasn't looking at radical definition as extreme. I was looking at it as, um, but I didn't do it, say it very well, that how does a radical feminist so go about changing the system, like radically, you know, making a whole new system? So, so could two people still have approached that whole suffragette thing and said, OK, I'm a radical feminist, but the only way I can see that we're going to change the whole system is if women get the vote, for instance. So they're both agreeing that we need rights for women. Radical are saying, no, we need to completely change the system. Liberal are saying, we'll just work within the system. But how does a radical go about changing the whole system? So it links to Magda's point about, I don't see how anyone could do that. And they could still have reasoned, well, you know what? We're not going to overthrow patriarchy or the whole system until we get a voice and a vote. So let's just go with this and do that first step in overthrowing the system as opposed to completely changing it overnight because we can't see how to do that. So that I think that was my issue about, then we could say radical feminists still got involved in that because they that was part of their method of achieving their goal. Yeah, but does that okay. make sense? Yeah. I'm gonna work back through the different contributions um, and share my thoughts to each of the different contributions that were made. Um, I think that what, and I'll say we keep, we trip up um, just as a movement constantly over the same thing is that multiple things are taught within this movement. And as we go from dispensation to dispensation, by that I mean, you know, if we think of 2001 to 2014, you know, those mini dispensations, God teaches their people something to get them through that dispensation while peering over the wall into a new dispensation that will provide, you know, the framework or the foundation for a new thought that will be built upon. But God needs to address things there and then there because they see a problem. And what we tend to do often is take lessons in context that arise due to issues that are being addressed and make that the truth the whole truth. And we know that's not the case when we read Ellen White. And Ellen White says something very specific in an area 
and we take that and make it all she has to say about a topic when in reality there was context attached to what Ellen White was saying. So we have this legacy from Adventism anyway, but we've carried it over into how we approach studies that are done within our context, within the movement. So Elder Tess will stand up and will associate liberal feminism through the lens of personal choice. And she'll speak about it in a way that leads you to look at it as being bad because there's a specific goal that she wants to achieve. But then what we do is we take that definition out of its goal, its context, and then we take that as the whole. And there's a statement that uh, Alda Parminda uses that authors have written of is what you see is not all there is. And that's applicable to our studies as well. What we see when we're presented is not all there is to the problem. So what there's one of the things that was shared at the time when we started grappling with what liberal feminism and radical feminism was, which is beauty. And we see that the someone gave an example during the last camp meeting of liberal feminism being equated to wearing makeup. What I want to do is why? Why is there that equation? Why do liberal feminists end up wearing makeup? Well, or, uh, yeah, why? So by, I see it as a consequence of liberal feminism, not what liberal feminism is. So when we go to the root of what these terms mean, and take them out of that one context and look at it more broadly, we can understand the different implications all around different studies that we can get to. And then the question came, okay, how do we change the system here? And I think that that's, that's where we're getting to when trying to understand what we're going to do as a movement. This morning we discussed how in different ages, God has worked through a liberal feminist approach and through a radical feminist approach through different issues. One example was um, how priesthood was, was attained, where at first you have this system of firstborn child male being the priest, and you get into a new system that Moses sets up where it's through the Levitical order, it's through merit. So there's this new radical way in which priesthood is going to be bestowed. So that's, I'll say, radical feminism. And then you have liberal feminism when dealing with the system of slavery. So when we talk about whether things are possible or impossible, it depends as it always does, with regards to what system you're looking at, what institution you're looking at, why it depends, why are some things so embedded into society and some things not, that's a question for another day. And what can we do about them? That's that's a question for us. Um, when we talk about what it means to be a radical feminist movement and what it means for our goal in this world, so we're building up to that point. Um, and then that's that's the same as what Emma had, had brought up, what can be done. And I, there was something that you said where you spoke about radical feminists working with liberal feminists. Sorry, but again, to try and um, not backtrack or to try and get us to thinking of them as two different approaches. Like just constantly remind that they're completely different approaches, that radical feminists are not seeking to change the system, but by compromising now, I use the word compromising, not in a dirty way, but by making small steps to get to that point. So it's not like they come up and they say, okay, we want to change the system, but let's do it through working with the system for now, and then eventually we'll change the system. It's, they're completely two different notions. 
one is working with the system because of the complexities of the issue, because for whatever reasons, it's working within the framework of the system. And the other is seeking to create a whole new system. What is achievable, on the other hand, is, is a different question. But you end up seeing that to be able to live, to be able to breathe, to be able to see, be seen as a person in the 20th century, women had to get the right to vote. Women had to get the rights that protected them in their marriage. So they had to go through the path or use the framework of liberal feminists. Slaves in Egypt, I mean, slave slavery for the Israelites. Moses had to put in place something that made people's lives better, if I want to call it that. There was no way that Moses could break down that institution of slavery, so to be a radical feminist. So Moses had to integrate Israelites and foreign nation slaves into an already existing structure. Um, so that's what we discussed when we spoke about Moses. And then Paul was another example that we gave, where you have two concepts, baptism, i.e. a person's relationship with God, changes from being this um, changes from being something that you attain in connection to your husband or your father to being this individual experience. That's radical because it's radically different by offering salvation or the gospel to Gentiles, free, slave, woman, man, and then knowledge where you have Paul integrating women into the system. Okay, don't challenge men out in public. Instead, you can have those discussions at home in private. And then now we get to the Protestant Reformation. So that's just a recap of <laughs> what we did this morning. But if we can keep in mind those differences and just think of the two in that way as, is it working with the system or is it wanting to create a new system? Both have their necessities dependent on the time in which you're living in, but they're both different from each other. So Protestant Reformation, when we think about um, its origins and its causes, I'll ask you, Blessing, because you brought it up. <laughs> um, what were the origins and causes of the Protestant Reformation? I guess I, I don't know. I'm not really sure. I guess sure. I was ask, yeah, I was asking because mm -hmm. I would have loved not that I would have maybe mm -hmm. yeah. I'm, I would want to hear what mm -hmm. people have to say about it. But I know one thing sure. is that definitely the abuse of power by the Catholic Church by the church is mm -hmm. one of the causes of the Protestant Reformation. So you have theological disputes that are going on in that era. Um, and the keystone of that is when Martin Luther nails his thesis on the door and contained within that is his critique of the Catholic churches is the Catholic churches um, will say selling indulgences, i.e. pardoning sins. And within that, he's questioning papal authority to do that, abusing this self-declared power that they believe that God has given them. And so, like the Millerite movement, this act or this dispute with the Catholic Church didn't initially intend to create a new church, but instead it wanted to reform the Catholic Church. Martin Luther didn't set about saying, I want to create a new church that stands in opposition to the Catholic Church. Instead, he approached the problem with wanting to reform the church. And so you have the influence of society and the Renaissance um, humanist thought that's spreading through Europe that leads to this greater emphasis on individual uh, scripture interpretation and you as a person can interpret the scripture on your own. 
Um, you don't need that hope to do it for you. You can have that religious experience on your own. And he critiques the church's deviation from, uh, we'll say at that time, sola scriptura from thus saith the Lord's. And so many rulers then go on to adopt Protestantism as they assert their independence from this abuse of power by the Pope and the papacy um, and etc. So that's its origins, its, its, its origins and its causes as this pushback against papal authority, um, whether with regards to science, with regards to interpretation of the Bible, with regards to how people are integrated into society, um, it's it's a big part of this is the theology just doesn't add up for Martin Luther and, and the various other reformers around him. And so the goals that he has are to return the Catholic Church to what they saw as the core teachings and practices of the Bible that the early church held to. So it's it's they place this emphasis on salvation through faith, um, the priesthood of all believers that compose the church, and the authority of the Bible over what had come to be church traditions in general. Remember I said that his intention was to reform the church. So let's abolish the practices that exists like indulgences, confession, pilgrimages, uh, clerical celibacy, and they're just viewed as corrupt and unbiblical. So if we can reform these, then we can get the church, which was the Catholic church, back to where the early church was. And so how they go about doing this, their methods and tactics are uh, through using the printing press that was a newly invented tool through um, forming alliances with different political and um, political reform movements of the time, much like first wave feminists. But as I've described it that way and how it originally started, so how it originally started, not what ended up happening, but how it originally started, where do we see the Protestant Reformation um, fitting into this liberal or radical uh, approach Would you say liberal because they didn't? They wanted to just change. They didn't want to change the whole thing, bring a new thing, and just sort of tweak what was the Catholic Church was already like mm -hmm. to what they wanted to reform it to. So we'd say liberal, but it looked radical, obviously. Reformation. So what you start off with is seeking to reform this existing religious framework. What Martin Luther initially didn't recognize is that. By changing these things within the Catholic Church, you're not addressing the reason why these things exist in the first place. So he didn't seek to create a new church that's built on different structures, processes, policies. Instead, he, um, or if I could say the movement, used existing um, methods, scholarly, uh, theo theological techniques to engage with the Bible and argue for change within the Catholic Church. However, the outcomes of said Reformation ended up being radical because you have this permanent division from the Catholic Church and the establishment of the various new Christian denominations, the Protestant um, churches. And so this aligns with what we've been saying is radical feminist goal of fundamentally transforming society structures because what he starts and then what ensues, or not him, but I'm using him as a symbol to represent the Protestant Reformation. What he starts is this, this rallying cry to think differently about how God's people here on earth, the church, are meant to be governed, are meant to operate. The idea of infallibility, the idea of a an individual standing as the representative of God here on earth, all that gets torn down 
and you have a different way of worshiping God through, and then you see that demonstrated in the different Protestant churches that, that um, arise. An issue that takes place is that some of these breakaway Protestant churches still have remnants of this papal doctrine in in how they are and how they're set up and how they are organized in in their methodology and in their interpretation there's there's different remnants of the papal church contained within them and as you get further along you see it getting more and more different to that original catholic church so the advent church being different and then we can compare and contrast what we are striving our movement to look like to that of what the catholic church does and did look like Curtis, um, so yep. would you see the millerites from liberal then if we just you know going by this i think again we can look at it as what they started off with versus what ended up happening i think they're liberal and we're the radical we could say the same about us anyway okay. Curtis. Yeah. Um, yeah, one thing I, I, I do want to say about the Protestant Reformation. <clears throat> if you're going to compare it with, with Adventism, Protestants in the 1260 did not oppose the system of church and state, or even the system of kings to begin with. But the mm -hmm. idea that, you know, um, churches basically up work with kings and influence public policy in a way on the earth. That's something that Protestants did as much as Catholics did. Mm -hmm. In the past, I used to think that, you know, Protestants opposed church and state, but they didn't. Um, mm -hmm. pa partly also, I guess, because the world they were living in wouldn't make it possible to overhaul the entire system of kings. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, with the churches. But when you get to the Millerite movement, one of the fundamental or key doctrines of the Millerite movement in the, you know, when it became a church, when it became a separate entity, 1844, it received the third angel's message. And the third angel's message is about the image of the beast. I think more than anything, the warning of the Millerites was about the role of church and state in the United States the role of Protestantism in being a persecuting power in collaboration with the government. I think that's something that Ellen White tried to teach and tried to emphasize both in Millerite history and second generation Adventism. So the, what I'm basically saying is this notion that sought to uh, totally dismantle the roots, you know, what actually allowed for persecution, which is the coming together of church and state, is something that was unique to Adventism. Mm -hmm. And that was a radical message by Adventism, which Protestantism did not hold to. So I'm not saying there are no Protestants, like, you know, today in particular, mm -hmm. that believe church and state should not be separate. But I'm saying when you look at 1260, and mm -hmm. Adventism. Definitely you can see a major change there because Protestants, they oppose the papacy, but they mm -hmm. fall short of saying we need to get rid of the system of church and state. They just work with it. Yeah. And then Adventism opposes the papacy, the beast and the beast's mark, but they go further and they say you need to actually dismantle this system of church and state. It's part of the kingdom of Satan. It's the mm -hmm. image of the beast. So, so you can actually see that Adventism's you... message was definitely radical in that sense. I'm not saying it's the only thing, but definitely um, that was a radical component of Adventist message. Are you limiting that, um, the uniqueness of Adventism in that regard to Protestant churches? So within a religious context and not including, you know, external political commentators like uh, yes, John Locke and etc. Yeah, because what I'm doing is I'm comparing Protestantism. Mm -hmm. That that that's my story. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got you. Um. And so, again, we see this liberal feminist work that's being done 
and will say, by God, in the era that they're in. And then we get to... So we've gone through Moses, we've gone through Paul and the Christian history, we've gone through the Protestant Reformation, um, and then we could do the same for um, the history of the Advent movement. Um, just the reason why I'm going over these different examples is just so we can get it in our heads of what liberal feminist gains look like and what a radical feminist approach would look like. We haven't discussed a radical feminist approach thus far, but there's three bigger examples of how we could see what liberal feminist, when we look at the problem that through this way, liberal feminists and radical feminists, how they approach dealing with these things or these institutions that make up society. So the first one is power. How do we think about power in society? If we think of that as an institution or a process or a thing that exists, how do radical feminists look at it and how do liberal feminists look at power? The second one is knowledge. So we've kind of touched on it when we discussed uh, Paul, but we'll explore that a bit further. And then the third one is beauty. Is how do we think of beauty? And and we could the list can go on and on and on of different examples that we can give um, of these three different elements. So uh what's the time now? I've lost track of how long I've been going on for. It's clock. Pardon, sorry? Eight o'clock, so you've had an hour and a quarter. We started a bit later, so we could go a bit later. Okay. I'll I'll go through power um and then we can touch on the next two at another time. But I I I get most of these thoughts. Um someone had mentioned how this author looks at power. Uh and so I went and I read more about it. And I think the way this author um, relates to it gives a good example of how you can look at power through the lens of a liberal feminist framework or through a radical feminist framework. So when we look at where humanity has come in the last 100 years or 50 years, even 50 years, we can see that there's more women in positions of power today than they were then. There's more women politicians, there's more women counselors, there's more women police commissioners, managers, CEOs, judges, whatever part of society that you would say that's where power resides. But when we look at what power is, we need to question our mental models or our cultural templates for what a powerful person looks like. So even though we have more women in these positions of power, what we discover when we self-introspect of what that cultural template is for a position of power is that it is male-coded. So what I mean by that is if you were to think of your stereotypical man, it's that power looks like that. And I think the study of the Apus Ball demonstrates this clearly, is that we have all these things related to a powerful God, which they are true that God possesses these characteristics, but they're coded in male terms. They are they reflect your stereotypical man. What we don't have is a template of what a powerful woman looks like, except that she looks like a man. So this morning, I spoke about how a few years ago, I can't remember what year it was, 2016, there was a wider call for women to wear trousers because that was a representation of women claiming back power 
I'm going to question whether that is radical in nature, or whether that was liberal in nature. Liberal feminists. Remember to keep in mind how we're defining liberal and radical feminists. So if you look at presidents, women presidents that have made it into positions of power, your Angela Merkels, or those that are striving for said power, Hillary Clinton, often you'll see them adorning or wearing, should I say, trousers. Because to them, it was a political statement that I am powerful. And these trousers may be convenient, practical, um, for what they needed to do, but it was a tactic used by them. It's to make said female appear more male. The reason why is so that society could recognize I too can be powerful. Me saying that doesn't mean that pants are male. And so by women wearing pants, they get to be male. It's instead questioning how we define what power is. So I've had this question about why it was necessary for women to wear pants or to, yeah, to wear pants. Why is that seen as a symbol of power? If when we look at a woman wearing a dress and when we look at a woman wearing pants, we know that our first instinct, our first reaction is to see that woman wearing pants as more powerful. If we see a man wearing a dress, we associate that man as being weak. And so weakness is always tied to what is female or what has been coded as stereotypical female. The uh, An insult that I would hear growing up when I went to an all boys school was when a guy showed any signs of weakness, he would be ridiculed. And the common slur was, I don't want to say it, but was to call him a rude word for women's genitalia because weakness had been associated with the female gender. And so it follows from the school of thought that women are perceived as belonging outside of what power is. And through the different waves of feminism, we've sincerely wanted them to get inside of that power, whether unconsciously or consciously, we've wanted women to grab onto that power. But the way in which we look at how they are getting that power is constantly coded in this liberal feminist approach. So if you've ever come across the terms of um, women breaking the glass ceiling or women knocking on the door, barging through the gates of the citadel, um, etc., all that is to say that women are outside of power and now are coming in to grab said power. Women in power are seen as breaking down barriers that existed before or taking something which is not quite theirs. There was a headline that was put in um, a new, the BBC some, some time back about uh, a woman who had climbed up the ranks in the church and she was up for being ordained or something within the English Anglican church. And the headline was, uh, women prepare for a power grab in church, police, and BBC. So when you hear that statement, what do we think of? What, what comes to mind with regards to women's relationship to power? And what comes to mind is that we need to consider our assumptions that we have in our heads about that relationship if we want to give women as a power and not just shape a few determined individuals that get it, their place inside of those structures, we have to think harder about how and why we think we do. So what I said a lot there, but 
what I'm trying to point out is that if there is a cultural template that exists that works to disempower women, what is that template? And where do we as a society get it from? Generally, women that do grab onto this power, grab onto power, are follow your archetype type of what a male is. So they behave like men. Having said that, that there's these deep cultural structures legitimating women's exclusion from having power. We know that trying to approach the problem gradually would take too long. And so we have to ask three fundamental questions. What power is What's power used for? And how do we measure it? Um, I was having a discussion with my father and my cousin this afternoon, and we were talking about the legacy of Rhodesia in Zimbabwe and the power structures that exist because of that legacy. And the example my dad or my cousin, I can't remember which one it was, gave was when you look at schools that were set up for, for context, Rhodesia um, was the colonial state name prior to Zimbabwe getting independence. Um, so in Rhodesia, schools were set up that were exclusively for white farmers' children. And some of these schools were, the names were Peter House and Falcon and etc. And so my father was making the point that all what's happened is those systems or those structures have remained, even though we've come out of this colonial period, Zimbabwe's come out of this colonial period, the structure still exists. And even though you have more people of color, more black people in those positions of power, if you ask yourself, what do those people of color look like? How do they behave? And what you typically find is that the black people that are given those positions of power in these ex-colonial schools are the ones that assimilate culture of white people. So it's the ones that behave like white people. It's the ones that talk like white people. It's the ones that go to white people's functions. So even though you have more representation of people of color, they still exist within a system that was put up in this institutionally racist framework. I give that as an example of what we see when we see more women CEOs, more women presidents, more women leaders, is that the framework is set up in a way that women only lead when they assimilate stereotypical male traits. So, thinking of it through a liberal or radical framework, we ask the question, okay, CEOs that are coming into power. Is the question to bring more women CEOs, more women presidents, more women politicians, that's your liberal feminist framework that are merging, integrating them into the system as what has been done already? Or instead of treating power narrowly as this object that only few can possess if they reach up and grab it, which has mostly been men. Um, can we start thinking about power differently? So it's not that it's not something that few individuals can reach up and grab, but instead thinking about it collaboratively, about the power of followers and not just leaders and thinking about power as an attribute that resides within all individuals. So this is one example where power 
can either be seen as something that gets grabbed, integrating women into a system that is patriarchal because they need to change themselves to fit into the system. And hence why you only get few that get to break that ceiling. Or can we change that system on its head and think of a radically different system, i.e. thinking about what it means to be powerful for society as a whole. So that's what I, I went through this just to give an example of how we can look at something and think, okay, what does it mean to look at this thing through a liberal feminist perspective or through a radical feminist perspective? And I don't want to say that those women that are now in positions of leadership are bad. It's what needed to be done to be able to hold on to power, to get power, to going through this process of breaking the glass ceiling. But a point that was made earlier is that we can see how fragile this is because as fast as power can be given, said power can be taken away just as quickly. Whereas if you try to envisage power differently as something that is not something that you grab and you break barriers to get, and instead being as something that resides throughout every individual uh, through a collective and thinking about how you think about it at its very nature, that would address the problems we see of why women are excluded from said power whether it be women or people of color or any marginalized group that can come to your head. The second example is that of knowledge. And um, I won't, hmm, I won't, I won't, I'll save that for next week's Vespers because there's still a lot more that I want to say about knowledge and beauty. But what I will get to, because it's within the context of the waves of feminism, is thinking of the right to vote, reproductive rights, and marital rights. And we can answer whether we think one is liberal feminist or achieved through radical feminist feminism. Um, yeah, Charity or Blessing, you have your hand up. Hi, Kajis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what you said is interesting about the subject of power. Mm -hmm. uh, it made me think of Mary Beard's book, um, yeah. Women in Power. Um, what I wanted to say is, even if you look at our, our movement, you know, when we first started out with the Midnight Cry, one of the fundamental things we identified was Hillary Clinton was the correct candidate for position of president of the United States. And we said that's who as a movement we were meant to support, even though we didn't. But we looked back and we said Hillary Clinton was the person who was going to save basically the American system. And it was going to continue in a path of, in the right direction, if I can say it that way, right? But when, when we look at that, we, I mean, I'm not saying it was wrong. It was definitely correct and needed to be said at that time. But having progressed down the reform line, we are looking at the whole system of the presidency now and we're identifying it with the patriarchal system. We're actually seeing how there's a lot of patriarchy embedded into the democratic system, which is why we point to the United States and say what's coming is shipwreck. Because okay. democracy is such a fragile system, even though it seemed to promote many good things. And it does and did promote many good things, you know, like... Um, the right to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, etc. But the system itself is patriarchal. So when we look at it today, we wouldn't actually say uh, in November, we want a woman president or we want a liberal president. What we are identifying is the system is not fit for purpose. That's what our message is now. In 2018, when we looked at 2016, we were like, Hillary Clinton is supposed to was supposed to be the president, you know? And we're just looking at it at a, I'll say we look at, looked at it from, okay, let me not say it that way, but basically we had not come to the formalization of the message where we 
understood that we are meant to be radical feminists. Initially, we were just talking about it as feminism or gender equality. But as we've progressed and come to a point where our position is radical feminism, we're no longer advocating for a female US president. We're actually saying the system is about to be destroyed. So therefore, there is need for an entirely different kind of system. So like what you're saying, it's not that we need more women in power. We don't need Hillary Clinton in American democracies or German democracies or British democracies, etc. What we actually need is an entirely new system of government that will not allow for the abuses that we see coming in to the American system that will allow for someone like Donald Trump to actually rise and have a very good chance at getting the presidency again, despite all the problems that he has. So yeah, I, j I just wanted to bring up that example, you know, to confirm what you were saying that a radical feminist won't say what we said in 2018. They'll actually say what we're saying now, which is the Sunday law is coming, America is about to be shipwrecked. The democratic system is not fit for purpose. It's, its fragility is going to be exposed or shown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, alongside that, when... Oh, the thought escaped my mind. Um... Sorry, I forgot. Oh, uh, just, just the fragility of democracy. I just want to give a, a, a small example of, of that of just how fragile democracies are and it's um it's trivial but um imagine a school that is ah sorry before i get there it's it's on this notion of requiring a totally different system so we have this system of government that exists that's patriarchal in its nature so if something is patriarchal in its nature we can see why it's been so difficult for women to become presidents anyway. So if we, as has been suggested, envisage a totally different system, we wouldn't have this problem of fighting for women to get into that system in the first place if at its core we had something that protected hum humans um, better uh, and so it wouldn't be such a slog. There would be no glass ceiling to break for women to become female presidents or leaders or whatever the case may be. Alongside that is this idea of presidents anyway. Um, it's envisaging a whole different type of, of government. I just wanted to point out that, um, making that point that the problem isn't that we do or don't want women leadership or etc. It's that it wouldn't be such an issue of having women leaders if the system was different. It's so difficult because the system is what it is. Um, Emma, you can, you... you can contrast that to the movement, then, couldn't you? Know we could. No. Emma, um, I know you were just about to, you just about mentioned voting. I think you did. You mentioned mm -hmm. right to vote. Were you going to talk about those things now? Reproductive rights, marital rights. What were you saying? That in the context of those three um, things, we want, we want to look at parents. whether something liberal those right. rights that were won are whether they won through a liberal feminist or radical feminist um, lens or approach. Okay, and just on the back of what Blessing was saying, that my question was, I guess, a practical one about does that mean that voting is not fit for purpose now? If we're saying, you know, on a practical level. Because we were at one point, I think, saying we should be voting. I don't know if we should or not. In certain countries, everything's different. But um, that's a can of worms because a vote's coming up, and we're like, we does it? It definitely depends on where you are, I think. But I even think even if in America, would voting be now? If we're saying the whole system is not fit for purpose, it's like, is that actually buying into a liberal feminist approach to vote? That's uh, this throw that brings out. into question. You know, again. We can't look at liberal feminism as a bad thing because as soon as we take that approach, um, we'll get to the conclusion, no, we shouldn't be participants in the field because we're radical feminists. But just by going through those examples where we showed how God had to work 
through a liberal feminist means because of the circumstances or whatever reasons my my position is is that we are called to be participants in that field regardless so sure it's going to be through a liberal feminist perspective but that doesn't mean that it doesn't undo our call to be radical feminists to envisage a new kingdom that can be set up that's my opinion at least Curtis, can I add something to that? Yeah. I think one parable that you, you sort of alluded to it in your language, mm -hmm. a parable that really shows the dichotomy or the dilemma that I think we find ourselves in is the parable of the wheat and tears mm -hmm. because the plants grow in the field. They're rooted in the field. And we say that represents uh, the human experience, the prophetic experience, where basically we are having to grow as plants in this world, because the field is the world, whether you want to call it the church, in the world, or the world's the same thing, because it's a patriarchal system that we are all trapped in, rooted in. And basically nature is showing or pointing to the fact that we have to grow, which I think is pointing to our identity as radical feminists, you know, having to be and become a radical feminist movement radical feminist members of a radical feminist movement within the context of a patriarchal system or world that we can't get ourselves out of because it's only the harvest that will finish that job. You know, the close of probation to the second advent period, that will basically finish that job. But before then, really we have that difficulty or that dilemma that we can't run away from. We are plants rooted in the world, in the, in the field, in dare I say it's sexist field so the, therefore for as much as we are radical feminists and have to advocate for you know identifying the causes of patriarchy discrimination dealing with issues at the root there's only so much we'll be able to do whilst we are rooted in the field mm -hmm. I think some things cannot happen within the context of the field a, a different parable has to be used, if I can say. Maybe the same parable when the plants are cut and then they are used or something. Mm -hmm. you know. But when you get to a certain point, that's when other things, I think, will become possible. Because really, like Magda said, some things I don't think are possible on this planet, which is why our message of the second advent, because we are Adventists at the end of the day, uh, the advent message, you know, when you talk about uh, Christ actually coming to bring an end to these earthly governments. That is central, I think, to a radical feminist type of movement or message. Because for, for you to have a radical feminist kingdom, the kingdoms that exist need to be removed and abolished. And I don't see how that will happen in its entirety until the second half. Emma, you have your hand up? It was that just from before. That was from before. I guess I wanted a more direct answer to the question, but that's all right <laughs> about voting. So, um, yeah, I understand. what I think I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. we're, we're radical feminists, understanding what a radical move, movement looks like or understanding what a radical feminist kingdom looks like. But you're saying at the same time to liberal feminist action is not bad because we've seen that God behaves in a liberal feminist and a radical feminist way, depending on the circumstance and situation. So you work with the system or you overthrow it, depending on the circumstance. So in this context, I know there's some things in the chat about, you know, voting, but I still, I'm still, I think, wrestling with that concept. That, that uh, the concept of the fact that we're right near the end and it's all going to be overthrown and this is not the solution to the problem. <laughs> voting, for instance, at the same time, recognising that voting was one through a hard slog, women died for it, et cetera. People died for it to give us the vote. All those things, that's one of our rights, et cetera. I think I'm still wrestling with what's, I guess it links into the question of what's our purpose, which is where you're heading, but we didn't get the conclusion. Sure. Can I, I, can I just, think... just say mm -hmm. some member elder from Inter and twin, uh, when was it, um, recently? It, it was in Wales anyway, in one of our camps. We were there. Um, Alta Minna said that we have a duty to vote 
and that what was something said already, but um, Emma just said we had a duty to vote, and voting creates prophecy. So there you go. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Sure. Um, I think uh, we'll close on this thought um, and then pick it up at another time. Um, it's ended up being a three-part study, but that's fine. Um, is that I'm just going to reiterate, uh, maybe say it in different words, what Blessing said, is that we are in this world. And so there are things that we are confined to in this world because of the circumstances that we're in. Um, we point to the Millerites and we see how in their vision of Jesus's coming, they saw themselves separate to the world. They cut themselves out from that field and we can look back retrospectively and see the problems that occurred because of them cutting themselves out from that field by not getting involved with politics, by solely focusing on this new kingdom that was about to be ushered in. And we've looked at that and we've recognized, okay, hold on. Before that new kingdom can be ushered in, there's a part that we need to play while we are still rooted in this field. And so the Millerites voting was such a big issue for them because all that they had in their minds um, when that election was coming up was that Jesus is coming. There's no need to get involved in the politics yeah. So let's think about that new kingdom in that radically different way for that new system that's going to be set up by God. And we are saying, Okay, the reason why we are voting is because, and this is the point that Blessing made, is that our plants, our roots are still embedded in this system that exists. So we have to be both participants in that system. It's something that we can't run away from while still exploring and envisaging what a different system does look like. It's, it's this concept of wearing multiple hats dependent on what story or what thing is being addressed. So I guess all this is to kind of why I've been showing this duality of God in these different dispensations is, is to try and understand when we say we are a radical feminist movement, what the implications of that are, what the implications of that are in our day-to-day -day lives, what the implications of that are with regards to our message, who that message is addressing. And another example can be given. A liberal feminist or liberal feminism sees that work is necessary. I need work to put bread on my table, to put food on my table, to have food for my family. And so all the corporations that exist out there that give work are built on this capitalist framework. And Going back multiple studies ago, we saw how capitalism is just survival of the fittest. It's, it's, it's built on this notion that patriarchy is built on. And so your liberal feminist will, be, will say, okay, how can I survive within this system? I can't detach myself from it. I can't change the system. How am I going to survive? It's okay, as a CEO of a company or you joining the company is, how can I ensure that at least my job will be good? At least I'll be safe in this job. Um, it will be better than living in a complete authoritarian regime. And your radical feminist approach will think theoretically, okay, instead of capitalism, how else would it look? I still need to live. So this is me with my liberal feminist hat on because I'm going to integrate into the system. I'm going to make my life better. I'm going to try and make my employees' life better. But how can I envisage a new system? And that's what we can do, because I think Magda pointed out on this small scale for us, we can overhaul the way we think about 
our knowledge is disseminated within our movement, who gets to be leaders within our movement, um, what the relationships are with the people in our movement. We can set up a radical feminist movement because it's different to all other organizations. But at the end, but at the end of the day, you still exist in a field that is not radically different. It is what exists. It's patriarchal. Um, so I, I really just regurgitated what people have said and how I've understood it. But as has been pointed out, Sabbath is drawing to a close. Um, so we'll close for today. Um, and is, oh, yes, I just wanted to, to show this, this one small example of just the weaknesses of democracy and institutions and processes that were put in place to protect democracy. Think of a school that's predominantly white people. I'll use this parable. 80% white people, 20% black people. And we know stereotypically, I'm, I'm going to be practical and realistic, that the two cultures have different tastes in music. And so the principal of the school thinks, okay, what type of music are we going to play at the school dance? And a student says, let's, you, let's vote. Let's vote for it. And so they vote. And as you can imagine, the outcome is 80% of the body say, let's listen to a type of music. And 20% of the people say, let's listen to this type of music. So what type of music do you end up getting? the one that is predominantly white music. So they take this vote. And since democracy is all about voting right, and the process itself was decided on democracy, would we say that that's fair? We'd say procedurally, it is fair. It's seemingly fair because everyone had a say. But this is why America, so this is just... Um, a mundane example of how you would say, let's elect someone. Democracy, the right to vote, you have America rising up and the majority is protected by that right to vote. And there's this recognition that that minority in that voting is not protected. Their rights are not heard. And so you have the first 10 amendments. You have this institution that's then built to protect your minorities, your Bill of Rights. You don't need a Bill of Rights to protect the rights of the majority in that circumstance, in a democracy, because that's what the vote does anyway. But when your Bill of Rights or that institution that's put in place to protect your minorities is attacked and is broken down, you can stand back and say, Democracy is doing what it's meant to do, but that's just one way in which we can see the weaknesses of said democracy in protecting the minorities. Hence why you have all these other institutions that get put in place around that democratic process of voting to protect your minorities. So at its core, that's why democracy is weak and patriarchal, because it doesn't recognize the minorities. So if we were to ask ourselves, okay, well, how should leadership be addressed in the movement? And the large call is right to vote. We demand our right to vote. I just want to bring up that there's dangers in that right to vote as well. And it's not necessarily that right to vote that makes liberal democracy strong generally. It's all the things that sit around it or support it or protect it, individuals in that government. Um, why did I bring that up? Oh, yes, when because we were meant to get to the point of looking at said right to vote that was won by the suffragettes and questioning, was that radical or was that liberal um, in what was achieved? Um, but we'll close there for today. Let's close with a word of prayer.
my laptop is frozen. Dear God, thank you for the conversation that we've had this evening. Thank you for the study. Thank you for um, the different contributions that were made as we try to grapple with the implications of being a radical feminist movement that lives in a society that's deeply patriarchal. Um, what does that mean for our message, for our work? Uh, continue to help us explore the true meaning of these different approaches of achieving equality. Uh, help us understand why you've had to use certain methods with certain issues so that we can, in our minds, understand you better. Uh, please be with us uh, through the week that's ahead in our work, in our day-to-day -day lives, in our relationships. Please help us guard them. And I pray that you may put your blessing